Okay, let's get started with it. Poker Clinic. We're going to talk about, today, we're going to talk about probability theory, calculating outs, and a little something called Bayes' theorem. So, it's kind of interesting. You know, when you think about probability, when you think about chance, it wasn't so long ago that no one really could tell you what the odds of, say, throwing a six on a, on a uh, six-sided dice was, uh, or die, uh, what the chances were of, of flipping heads on a coin, right? It, w it was all just kind of left to fate, left to the gods. It was, you know, it, w it was kind of, uh, and, and in fact, it, w it was almost, you know, blasphemous to even suggest that you could predict that kind of thing. What are the chances that it's going to rain tomorrow? To even say, well, I think I can come up with a prediction is basically saying that you can predict the mind of, of God, basically. And it was, it was, you know, you know it, it was heresy in, in some circles. It was actually like, you know, and, and you, you, you kind of look back at like the Dark Ages, right, before the Renaissance, when, you know, they, they were burning people at the stake for all sorts of reasons. So, uh... People didn't really, you know, people kind of left it alone. It wasn't until uh, pretty recently that that we had some 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 guys back in you know history actually tackle this idea of of predicting predicting the future because that's what really we're talking about when we talk about uh, probability theory. What we're talking about when we talk about the history of probability, we're we're saying we want to be able to predict what's going to happen, and it's it's really an awesome thought, you know, that we could actually predict something. We could actually predict what the future is going to be. Um, so when we think about the history of probability, there, there really are basically two, maybe three people who really spring to mind. And uh, it, it all comes down from this idea of the problem of points, right? So most of probability theory resulted from games of chance, people trying to solve games of chance, thinking about how they would be able to get an edge in a casino or against their friends, playing backgammon, for example. And back in the back in the 1400s, there was this guy who uh, came up with this this problem called the problem of points. And it goes like this, right? You know, let's say you know, Dodgy, you and I are playing backgammon, and uh, we're we're saying we're going to play for we're going to play for 90 bucks, right? And we're going to play a best of 10 match. Whoever whoever uh who, whoever you know wins wins the most out of out of 10 wins the 90 bucks, right? Of course that wouldn't really be a good idea because we could we, we'll say if if it's even 50-50 split, then uh, it's a push. Okay, so we're going to we're going to play 10 games of backgammon. No doubling cube, just 10 games straight. We're going to see who wins. And uh, at some point in our match, you know, before it's finished, you get a phone call, or I get a phone call. I get a phone call from XM1. She's like, you got to come home right now. Uh, you know, June's in trouble, and you have to come, you have to come home. And, and she, she climbed a tree. You have to get her out of the tree. I'm like, okay, I'll be right back. I'm like, oh, Dodgy, how are we going to work this out? Can we just finish the game later? And you're like, nope, this is the last time we're ever going to get to play. So let's divide up the money. And we're like, well, how do we divide up the money? And that is the problem. How do you, you know, how do you equitably divide up money when the game's not finished? That's the problem of points. And this was a real tough question for people. It still is, right? I mean, like if you're at a, uh, if you're at a, a final table of poker and you're like, okay, well, let's make a deal. How do you even go about it, right? No one really knew, you know, and no one even you know, knew how to even begin tackling this problem uh, until sometime in the late 1400s. So this guy comes up, Luca, pretty smart guy. He's the guy who actually also invented uh, double entry accounting. So 1494, he comes up with a solution. He's like, okay, what you need to do is you just need to divide up the money uh, based on the ratio of of who who's won so far? So, you know, you, we're we're playing ten games. Well, if I won five games you know, and Dodgy won four games, then I get fifty dollars and Dodgy gets forty dollars. Five to four. 
And it's like, great, problem solved, and everyone's happy. And Luca you know, goes on and does some other things, and he dies maybe, maybe 10, 15 years later. Problem solved, problem of points, uh, wasn't so hard after all. Except then this guy Niccolo comes along, and he's like, no, that is not the way to solve this problem, because look what happens. Now, if, if you just go by ratio, look what happens if, if, if Dutch wins the very first game, and then they get the call. Then you have to give all the money to Dutch, and he only won one game. You know, if, if you, so he, he, Niccolo tried to solve it. You know, he was like, that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't, it's not really fair for you know, Dutch to win one game and get all the money. I was like, yeah, that's not fair either. What do you suggest, Niccolo? And Niccolo was like, well, I think that we need to do something with like a ratio or something, but uh, I don't know. It's unsolvable. You know, the world may never know. It's just one of those things where no matter how you divide the money, uh, someone's going to complain. And everyone was like, yeah, that sounds right, Niccolo. Uh, and life went on. You know, for like another hundred years, no one really thought about the problem of points. It was just unsolved. Until this guy named Antoine Gumbo. Gumbo. French guy. He was an amateur mathematician. Gumbad. Gumbo. Uh, and he, he was thinking about this problem of points some more. And he was like, you know what? This is a, this is a, a, a good question. A good question. I've got... You know, I've been doing a lot of gambling and a lot of thinking, and I can't figure it out. I think that we should revisit it. So he sends a letter to a couple of other French mathematicians, and these two guys decide to tackle it. And the first guy was this guy named Blaise Pascal. Now, Blaise Pascal, one of the brightest guys in the history of mathematics, uh, was in this real bad horse accident uh, and got real religious. So now when you think about Blaise Pascal, most people think about Pascal's wager where he basically came up with a little grid and said, you know, if you if you believe in God and nothing, you know, and there's there is no heaven, then nothing happens, but if you don't believe in God and there is a heaven, then you go to hell. Therefore, God exists and you should believe in him. Basically is what this little square said, Pascal's wager. Um, but you know what he actually contributed to the world was uh, was a lot more than that little box. Uh, and this, this problem of points was really solved by Pascal. He had a, he had a buddy you know, named uh, Pierre uh, Fermat. And these guys, you know, basically they were like, you know, Pierre and, and Pascal, they were like the bestest of friends, you know, like the bestest of friends that have ever been that get together and be like, hey, Pascal, what are you up to? Oh, not too much, Pierre. You want to get together and solve some riddles? Yeah, let's solve some riddles. And that's what they would do. So they'd write letters back and forth, and they came up with this idea, you know, th this, this thought about this, you know, th this problem of points that their buddy Antoine had sent a letter about. He finally came up with it. And they, they said, you know what we've got to do is we've got to determine all the different possibilities that exist, and then we have to divide the money according to the ratio of each player winning and all that, you know, that, 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 all of those different possibilities, like that probability space is basically what they came up with. And they called this Pascal's Triangle. And now we basically had the solution. This was the, the solution for that whole problem of points. And this was basically the foundation, the very beginning of probability theory. This is it. Probability theory in a nutshell. The probability of something happening, the probability of X plus the probability of not something happening, the probability of not x, all adds up to 1. And that is what Pascal came up with. The whole idea that this probability space all adds up to 1. And you can kind of, you, you, you can kind of uh, adjust that formula a little bit, and you can say, okay, well, the probability of x, the probability of something happening, is equal to 1 minus the probability of not something happening. And that's it, man. That's probability theory in a nutshell. And, you know, it looks, it looks simple. It is pretty simple. But um, it's so crazy to think. You know, this was just foreign. You know, it wasn't until pretty recently. You know, 1654, that is not a long time ago. 350 years before someone really, you know, put this into words and said, okay, well... The chances of rolling a six, for example, 
is one in six. The chances of you know of, of being able to roll a die, um, you know, over and over and over, the chances of of, of not hitting a six it, it can it can actually be calculated, and you know, and, and we can figure it out. And so, yeah, you know, this is this is. You know, kind of the basis of you know casinos. It's the, it's the basis of, of of modern probability theory, and there's there's some pretty interesting thoughts about it, right? Here's here's a question for you: How many times do you have to flip a coin um, before you can be guaranteed that you actually get heads, right? I mean, probability theory has something to say about that, and it's it's kind of a trick question. Uh, I'll leave it to you guys to to kind of think about it. So let's look at counting odds, counting outs, and calculating odds. You know, when we think about probability theory as poker players, we aren't dealing with, uh, with, with dice or points. We're dealing with cards, 52 cards. And uh, normally when we're looking at trying to figure out how to, how to calculate our odds or equity in any given situation, what we do, you know, we, we go through kind of a, a, a process, right? First, we count our odds, then we kind of come up with the ideas of hitting our hand. So, uh, let's get an example. Let's look, th look at the odds of hitting a flush with one card to come. So, in our example, we're, we're going to say that you've got five, six of hearts, and the flop came out with a flush draw, right? And you know, the turn came out and you missed, so you've got one card to come. Uh, what are your odds of actually hitting that flush? Well, we can, we can figure that out. Step one is you count your outs. So you say, okay, well, there's 13 total hearts in the deck. I've got two of them, and there's two on the board, so there's nine left. Those are my outs. These are the, you know, outs are the cards that you have to hit to be able to make your hand. You know, the, your, your, uh, you know the, the good cards. Those are your outs. And then step two is count all the cards left in the deck. So two in your hand, four on the uh, four on the board, 52 total. So there's 46 cards left. Your probability of hitting your flush is nine out of 46, right? And you'll notice, like the probability of not hitting your flush is, you know, you know plus the probability of hitting your flush all adds up to one. This whole idea that all of the different possibilities all equal 100%, you know, that that basically can be tracked directly to Pascal. So you come up with, uh, you know, when you're actually in the field, when you're actually at the table, right? And yes, Mirko, that's right. There's never a guarantee to get it. It's infinity. <laughs> it's infinity, which is just kind of crazy, right? Um, so when you're actually in the street, you, you know, like you're, you're actually at the felt, in the wild, and you've got you know you you you've got this uh, you've got all these numbers kind of going through your mind, and you're trying to figure out okay, well, you know, the, here's the pot, and this is how much it is, and this is how much I have to call, and I know how I I, I know that I probably have to make you know a, a a flush to win. I know I have nine outs, so what is nine out of forty six? And you pull out you know you pull out your calculator. That's not really what we do. Uh, when we're actually in the wild, right? As poker players, we use shortcuts. I'm going to let you in on one of the, the best shortcuts that you can find, and it's this two percent. Uh, it's basically the the uh, two percent rule. Basically, you know, to get a rough estimate of uh, what your equity is in any given hand, what the percentage of hitting you know a, a flush is, is you you basically count your outs and then you give yourself two percent per out per street. So in our last example. With nine outs, one card to come, we're looking at about 18%. So it's going to be a little off, right? It's not quite 18%, it's actually 19.5. If we had uh, two cards to come, if we were on the flop, and we wanted to get all of our money in with nine outs, then we'd be looking at around 36%. 2% per out per street. This is a much easier calculation to do in the fly. You know, when you're actually in the heat of the moment, trying to decide whether you want to actually you know, make a call or, you know, trying to, you know, trying to determine your equity. And it's always just a little bit off, 
you know, but uh, it, it's close enough to get the job done in most situations. And you know, you can you can you, you, you can leave the calculator at home. You can save the mental energy for uh, you know for, for other things rather than trying to de get down to the decimal point about what your equity actually is in a hand. So uh, yeah, G Heeb saying he uses it hundreds of times a day. I use it hundreds of times a day. You know, pretty much any time I'm in a situation where I have to uh, make a determination, you know, post flop about whether I'm going to continue with the hand. You know, I raise, I get re-raised, and I'm getting two and a half to one. And I, net, you know, I have to go through this this kind of calculation. And say, okay, well, I'm pretty sure I have nine outs here. Sometimes you have more. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, I think that I I, I can make my flush, and I can hit one of my overcards, and it's it's going to, you know, I'm going to come out smelling okay. So eleven outs, you know, or twelve outs, or you know, fifteen outs. However many outs that you have, use this shortcut, and it's going to save you some time. Remember, it's a little bit off, and generally, the more outs you have, the more off it is. Okay, but uh, it, it it generally gets the job done. If if it's you know, the more outs you have, the less important it is to really get down to the decimal. You know, if if you're looking at you know being a favorite in a hand, and you're like, okay, well. The two percent rule, you know, the two percent shortcut says that I'm a bigger favorite than I actually was. Well, does it matter? Not really. Okay, let's talk about something else. I want to talk to you about Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem is something. Uh, it's attributed to this guy Thomas Bayes. This is a uh, is a, a minister from uh, England, lived uh, 1700 to 1761. So. Um, you know, 60 years old, good run at life, I guess. Died too young, probably. But, uh, yeah, he, he's pretty much attributed to this, this, uh, this theorem, this idea. And it's kind of interesting. So Thomas Bayes, this isn't really him. You know, this is the picture that, that everyone attributes to him. But uh, from what you know, my research is uncovering is that you know, the, the, the outfit that he's wearing actually isn't consistent with the time and the place that he was supposed to be at. So we got a picture of Thomas Bayes that's not really him. We also have a, uh, a theorem that's named for him that also isn't really his. Uh, it turns out that you know, the, the first idea of, of being able to adjust the probability of something based on a data set, that's basically what, what Thomas Bayes is credited for, this idea of Bayes' theorem and uh, updating your you know, updating your, your, your assessment of, of something, of, of a probability, basically. It, uh, it, it, basically what happened was Thomas Bayes was writing a whole bunch of notes, then he dies, and this guy named Price comes along, picks up all of his notes, and gives a little speech to the Royal Society. And you fast forward to this guy, who's the real deal, this is back in the 1800s, who kind of takes that talk uh, from the notes of a dead guy, and puts it all together into Bayes' theorem. And he gives credit to Thomas Bayes, good old Pierre Laplace, um, one, of the, one of the greatest minds in the history of history. And this is, you know, this is, this is pretty recent, you guys. This is 1819. You know, you look back, it's like 200 years ago. You know, it, it, it's crazy to think, like, you know, you could be doing the same kind of thing now. You know, we, we might be coming up with stuff, you know, down the line that people are going to be talking about for hundreds of years in the future. Um, so Pierre comes up with this idea of Bayes' theorem. This is it. This is it in neon. And this is it in uh, just regular text. Basically, the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Uh, that is a very, very fancy way of basically saying you've got to adjust your chances of something being true Based on, uh, you know, based on the evidence and based on, on you know, a, a continued data set. So let me give you an example of this, right? And this is the best example uh, I've I've come up uh, like I've ever heard. It came from a book by uh, a fellow poker player turned uh, legit, Nate Silver. Now Nate Silver used to play over at the Bellagio in the two five no limit game, the five ten no limit game. He quit that to go into making political predictions. Then he wrote a book called The Signal and the Noise, where he gave an example of Bayes' theorem that I think demonstrates this point really well. Basically, imagine where you were 
during 9-11, right? And if you were like me, you were, you know, you were up in the morning, you were watching the news, and you got the news that that first plane hit the tower. And questions, you know, are going through your mind, and you're trying to assess the, the, the probability that what you're seeing is an attack or, you know, just, just, just an accident. And if you're like me, you looked at that and thought, oh, wow, that's such a horrible accident. You know, what, how, how did this happen? What, what must have been going on? Um, you know, probably pilot error, you know, maybe a, a mechanical mistake, but what a, what a horrible accident this is. And you fast forward a half hour and you got, an, you got another plane crashing into the, same, you know, into the next tower. And all of a sudden, you, you adjust your probability. You know, when the first plane hits, you're looking at it and saying, well, what, what are the, what, what's the probability that this is a terrorist attack? It's very, very low. Very low. But when that second plane hits, you have to adjust that probability of A, that it's an attack, given that there were two planes into two separate buildings right next to each other. All of a sudden, it's looking pretty good. It's looking like, yeah, this is definitely an attack. So... Of all the uh, of all the examples that I've come up with, and there's a lot of examples that people you know use to show how you can apply this this you know this Bayes theorem. Of all the examples that I've ever seen, I think Nate Silver's is the best. Um, there's others, you know, drug test examples, um, cancer screening examples. One one that I came up with that I'll probably use for my book Poker Tells is the chances of being able to pick up a girl in a club. You know, that's uh, Let's say that your your friends are always trying to get you to go to a certain club in Vegas, and they're like, oh, come on out, yeah, you know, come on out to this club. Uh, it, it's new, and you know, there's so many, you know, two worst girls ready to just just go home with you. 100, percent you're gonna get, you're gonna get, you know, be able to bring a girl out of the club. And so you go in the first night, and you, you come home, and you know, you come home alone, and and you uh, wake up the next day with a hangover, and you're like, oh, well, that didn't work. The very next night, you guys are like, come on out. Let's do it again. Uh, 100%, this is, is going to happen for you. And you go and you can't pull a girl out of the club. And night after night after night, you can't pull a girl out of the club. So every single time that happens, you pretty much have to adjust your probability downward that you're going to be able to go in and pull a girl out of the club. You know, that's, uh, I can't really think of you know, a, a, a better example where we can use Bayes' theorem and apply it to real life. Right. So, yeah. What's the takeaway? Right. Well, let's talk about a little bit of about probability um, versus likelihood. Right. This is kind of interesting to think about, too. There's actually a difference. Most of the time when people say, well, what what's what's the likelihood of something happening? What's the probability of something happening? Those two terms are used interchangeably. They're, they're used to mean the same thing. The, in 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 statistics and you know mathematics and you know like in, in these kind of probability th fields they actually mean two separate things. Probability is is the chances of something that we can actually kind of know, right? What are the chance? You know, what are the probabilities of you know, what, what's the probability of rolling uh, you know snake eyes when you roll two dice, something like that. Likelihood is something that we we can't really know, and we we assess likelihood. Um, and we, we take like the results and try to assess the likelihood. So imagine like this, right? What, what, is the, uh, what is the likelihood that you have an edge in your local 1-2 no limit game given uh, a year's worth of, of results where you've been able to, to uh, pull out $35 an hour uh, as an hourly rate over, you know, a, a sample size of eight hours a day for, you know, 60 different sessions. So what is the likelihood that you are actually a positive EV player in that environment? You know, it's something that we, you can't actually ever really know. You can just kind of estimate. And that's, you know, when we think about, like, what your, you know, what your EV is in a spot, what your ROI is in a spot, what your hourly rate is in a spot, these are all just guesstimates because you can't really know what your hourly rate is going to be you you can kind of understand you know, know what it was. Um, I mean, you can definitely know what your hourly rate was. You can't really know what your EV was or your ROI was 
and what your expectation was, but you can kind of get a likelihood of it based on results. Uh, and as, as far as future results go, you know, what, what's the likelihood that you're going to be able to continue to win in the game that you've been winning at? You know, I, I would say pretty high, but uh, you can't really know. But we can kind of use this idea of Bayes' theorem to always kind of be adjusting, um, you know, a, a, adjusting the way that we see the world and adjusting the way that we see, um, you know, our chances in a given situation. One thing that I would say, you know, a, a good takeaway from all this is, one thing that I would, I would say, we can say, thank you, Thomas Bayes, and, you know, thank you, Pierre Laplace. Uh, here's something real, um, you know, real definite that we can use Bayes' theorem for is the idea of a stop loss. Uh, I would suggest to you that the likelihood that you actually have an edge in any specific game actually goes down the more you lose in that game, right? So if you go to a game and you, uh, you, you, you sit down with a buy-in, let's say you're, you're playing at the, your, your local 1-2 No Limit game, you sit down with a $200 buy-in, and you, you, know, you lose it over the course of two or three hours. I would suggest to you that you should probably lower the likelihood that you even have an edge in the game that you're sitting in. And what I would say is that one application that we can use Bayes' theorem for in poker is this whole idea of a stop loss. Um, make sure that you don't go to a game with more, like more than you know, two buy-ins. And after you lose two buy-ins, just walk away from the game and say, you know what, I think that the likelihood that I actually have an edge here, it, you know, is, 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 it has to be lower than when I first sat down. Um, I, I think that's a good rule of thumb. So here's a little bit of further reading. Two, uh, two books that I would suggest you read that I, that I read, I enjoyed. I thought that uh, it got a lot of, out of them. This book, Nate Silver's The Signal and the Noise, Why So Many Predictions Fail But Some Don't, is a pretty good overview of, of some of these ideas. And then uh, uh, Peter Bernstein's Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk, is uh, a, a, a very good uh, treatment of the history of probability theory. kind of goes through really in-depth into into all these guys we've talked about a lot more than you know than we can in a uh, a thirty minute poker clinic. So that is that is poker clinic session number one. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get to some questions, and then we're going to get back to our WSP grind. So uh, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Mirko the Crow says, I use Nash theory to pick up girls. <laughs> I like it. You know, I'm thinking, uh, you know, Mirko, I don't think that there would be a game theory if there wasn't first a probability theory. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's, all, it's, it's all building blocks, and it's pretty cool. Cooper December saying uh, he's flying out to Vegas July 19th. Uh, looks like you're going to be missing the uh, World Series, huh? Kim, Kim Unger saying uh, Silver's website is gold. 538.com. Definitely, a, I would suggest you guys take a look at that. So that's it, you guys. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the take the webcam off. The, um, starting soon for 